as we look to our Lord in prayer. And so, Father, as we're looking now at this portion of Scripture, thanking you for this series begun last September and the way in which your, your books of the Bible are meant to be unpacked verse by verse. Speak to our hearts this morning. We are multiple generations, this congregation. We extend over multiple services. We are a church, whether we be physically present or via live stream, we're one. But our oneness is found in Jesus Christ and him alone. So, Father, in these moments to come now, form these hearts. Engage these minds. Shape these wills. As again, our Father, we've come here to see Jesus. Him only. Praying these things again now in Jesus' name. Amen. The end of World War II, U.S. Astoria has been hit by a torpedo, begins to sink. And there is a Midwesterner whose name was Signalman Third Class Elgin Staples. And about, oh, 200 hours, he is swept overboard by the blast. About all 600 hours now, as I look at the records of the account, he was rescued by a passenger destroyer, returned to the Astoria, whose captain was attempting to save the cruiser by beaching, only to be hit by still another torpedo. Out into the waters again, he found himself. Only to be picked up again, this time by the USS President Jackson. He was one of 500 survivors, naval records tell us, of the battle who were... Uh, excavated, or rather evacuated, to a setting known as Numea. And on board the transport, the story tells us that Staples was hugging that life belt, wouldn't you, with gratitude, looking at that small piece of equipment for the very first time. We take so much for granted, don't we? He was scrutinizing, he was studying, he was evaluating every stitch, stitch of the life belt. It served him, saved him. Interestingly, it was manufactured by Firestone Tire and Rubber Company of Akron, Ohio, and it bore registration number. Given home leave, Staples told his story and he asked his mom, who worked for Firestone, about the purpose of the number on the belt. And she told him that the company insisted on personal responsibility for the war effort, and that the number was unique and assigned to only one inspector. Staples remembered everything about the life belt. He quoted the number. And there was a moment of stunned silence in the living room. And then his mom spoke. That was my personal code that I affixed to every item I was responsible for approving. His was a rescue story. As the Apostle Paul, 3,600 feet altitude, 100 miles inland, in what is now modern day Turkey, has opened up and explained one after another the stories of the Old Testament that leads, of course, to the ultimate story, the story of Jesus. We're simply going to pick up where we left off. And what I want to do with you now is to inch towards what I will call that climactic event, the story of all the stories, where everything gets connected now, where the Apostle Paul, generational by generational emphasis, has been connecting the dots, developing the plot line, 
offering the Jewish story that is meant for the Gentile populations as well, and now he's at the point where he's got everybody leaning forward because now we're going to talk about Jesus, you see. So what I want to do with you this morning is to talk about what I will call the climactic event to this extraordinary story of redemption. It's a plot line that's unfolding. And as we trace this plot line of scriptures from the Older Testament into the Newer toward Christ, I want you to first of all note with me the message here that God has sent. And you see it in verses 26 and 27. He begins, Brothers. He's found his on ramp, you see. You see, you've got to know your audience when you're speaking. If you're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got to know a little bit about the person to whom you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where they're coming from. What are their issues? What are their challenges? How do you enter into the conversation of what matters most, you see? So now, if you are trying to figure out how to get involved and enter into the conversation that matters most, he now identifies, I've got a Jewish audience on my hands. They've got to understand that as a rabbi, I'm Jewish. I want to connect with them. And so he begins, brothers, now find a way to connect with people, okay? Even in these turbulent times, in turbulent times, timeless truths are needed. So the Apostle Paul now, he begins with brothers. He's found his on-ramp. He wants a relational connection, as do you, as do I. He continues, sons of the family of Abraham, you can almost feel the deep breath here. That's where the promise was given. Generation by generation, these people identify their Jewishness, you see, with Abraham. And so he's with them. He's connecting. And when you want to deal with the ultimate story within the story of redemption, you've got to connect and you've got to know where people are coming from. And so now he's talking about their heritage. Know the heritage of the people. Understand the backgrounds of the individuals, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham. But now he knows his audience. And as he looks out over the landscape of the synagogue, he realizes there's Gentiles as well as Jews present. Now you want to make sure you know who you're talking to. First service, I typically stand in the back, take a look around, get a sense of my bearings. I do the same with second, do the same with third. Sorry for our live stream, can't see you at this moment. Hopefully we're connecting. But at the same time, he makes his connection, he knows his audience, and he spreads out a little further. And um, those among you who fear God, listen, listen, brings it home narrows now the vehicle. To us has been sent the message of this salvation. Now at this point he hasn't said in what the message is and who this is all about to any extent. Oh, he did identify a Savior in Jesus as God as he promised. But we need to flesh this out. Now, the Jews were given the responsibility of being able to communicate the word of grace to the entire world. In Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul had written, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. The question is, what do you do? With that, you have been entrusted with. Here now, he is about to unpack it. He realized God has entrusted him with the communication of the message. So here it is. To us has been sent the message of this salvation. So now he is on to the rescue story. He wants to tell them exactly what this involves. And what they've got to bear in mind is that this is a family rescue story. It's the Jews that are extending this word of grace to the Gentile population. And he offers now, you're up to verse 27, a key word in the Greek, 
because he now deals with the word for. He's going to give you now a, a reason. He's going to connect this prior verse to what comes next. And so in verse 27, for those who live in Jerusalem, they say, we know them. we got family there. We've got a second cousin there. We know some of the people first name. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, Because they did not recognize him, note that, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, didn't process it, which are read every Sabbath. In other words, you can be there where the truth is being presented, but the truth is not being processed. Fulfilled them by condemning him. These were religious people that condemned Jesus, you see. Not secularists, but religionists. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the religionists and the secularists alike. And the reality is they were simply unaware that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords was in their presence. Steve Brown, gifted expositor, tells the story about the end of the British rule in India in the 1940s. Well, you see, there was a group of social scientists who decided to do a study to see the impact of the end of the British rule in India on the life of the nation. But you know what? They gave up after six months because they discovered that as they went through the villages, most people were not even aware the British had been present. See where we're going with this? These people had grown up with the scriptures. They were in the epicenter of it all, Jerusalem. Yet they were unaware that the Messiah was present. And so now what the Apostle Paul is saying is that we've got to make certain that just because we are present as the truth is being presented, it doesn't mean we are processing what the truth is being presented as. Be processors. Personalize it. Internalize it. Memorize it. By all means, analyze it. Get your arms around it and make it yours. Jesus died for you, you know. That's where salvation is found. Synagogue people are most likely leaning forward all the more at this point. Tell me more, tell me more. I can imagine that they're saying in their hearts, they've got this gifted rabbi who's traveled this distance now. He's been there. He has seen it all. He's been in Jerusalem. And what is interesting, the persecutor has become the proclaimer. The one who created such turbulence is now the one who's communicating such truth. You and I live in turbulent times. And what you and I have got to be mindful of is that we've been entrusted with the opportunity to communicate timeless truths in turbulent times. Find ways to apply truth to the moment of the hour. And so now, they've been following the plot line. He's been talking about Abraham. He's been talking about David. He's connecting the dots. And you and I have got to connect the dots for people. Don't allow for the stories to be disconnected from one another. As you and I, as we trace the plot line of scriptures toward Christ, note, first of all, the message that God has sent, 26, 27. But second of all, as you and I, as we trace the plot line of scriptures toward Christ, note the work that God has accomplished in 28 through 31. Now, he's telling them, and he's got firsthand experience of what was happening in the vicinity of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. We're talking about social injustice these days. The ultimate form of social injustice is when the guiltless one was put to death by the guilty ones. When the sinless one was put to death at the hands of the sinful ones. 
This is the ultimate form of collective guilt, you see. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so now they found in him no guilt, worthy of death. But that's not going to stop them at this point, you see. So what do they do? Now these are religious people. But nonetheless, they asked Pilate to have him executed. Now they, as the religionists, turn to the secularists. And they turn to the governmental system. They turn to the judicial system. And they want to have their way with regard to having this one who has been found guiltless executed because of the emotions of the moment. Now you can imagine they're in the synagogue and this is a rabbi who's speaking. And furthermore, he's got vested interest in this story because he was the persecutor, now the proclaimer. In turbulent times, we need timeless truths and we need timely truths. Where's he going to go with this? What's he going to say next? He's pulled Pilate into the story. He's got now the secularists and the religionists tied together in this whole matter of God's sovereign plan for redemption. Where's it going? You have to verse 29. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, all that was written of him? Yeah. Because if you go back to the Older Testaments, all of this was promised. You can go back to Isaiah chapter 53 and inch through that entire extraordinary chapter slowly but surely and find out all that was written of him. They're processing, they're thinking. It means then that all the details pertaining to Christ's death did not escape the sovereign hand of God. Why God was using religious unbelievers and God was using secular unbelievers jointly to achieve his sovereign purpose of Jesus Christ, the guiltless one, dying for the guilty ones so that we might have redemption in Christ and in Christ alone. This is extraordinary. And they're processing because they're listening to the one who is the persecutor tell this story. Now, you and I have a story to tell. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, understand that everybody loves a story. Everybody loves a redemption story. Everybody wants to get rescued. And here it is. So now, you're up to verse 29. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, the Older Testament and the plot line of generation by generation of the writings pertaining to the one who was to come, they took him down from the tree. And they're looking at one another at this point and say, that tree, Deuteronomy chapter 21, talks about curses everyone who dies on a tree, you see. And again, the Apostle Paul will connect the dots between the Older and the Newer Testament. He'll do the same for them in his book of Galatians. And the book of Galatians was written to these people because these people were in the province of Galatia, you see. You see the connections? They took him down from the tree. They laid him in a tomb. Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus, the women at that tomb, reflecting upon the significance of the hour, the cross of Jesus Christ. Those of you that are basketball fans and you love your college basketball, you might know that one of the greatest of all the coaches, UCLA, John Wooden, loved Jesus. And he always kept the cross in his pocket, always. He kept it there to remind himself Day in, day out, there is always something more important and someone more important than what he was facing at that given moment. You want to stay cross-centered in turbulent times. In times of crises, look for the cross and bring the cross to the crisis. You see. So no matter where you're sitting right now in the live stream, process it. Apply it. Know it. Bring Christ to the crisis. 
and allow God to speak. And then something significant happens. You see what comes next. But God. Everything goes wrong, and then all of a sudden this powerful combination of words kicks in, found again and again and again. But God. But God raised him from the dead. I can see now the heads turning there in Antioch, Pisidia. In other words, God has validated the work of Jesus Christ. And furthermore, in case you need some kind of legal attestation via witnesses, verse 31, And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him, from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And the most astounding thing is that here is the Apostle Paul, the persecutor becoming proclaimer, the one who put Stephen to death because he was witnessing the resurrection of Jesus Christ within Jerusalem's precincts, This one now is likewise witnessing to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One of the extraordinary evidences of the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the transformed life of those that were opposed to Jesus Christ, who then followed Christ because their lives were now at risk, or those who were so scared because they were identified as followers of Jesus Christ, but then hit the streets of Jerusalem like Peter and John, proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's the Apostle Paul. And this message that he was delivering in Antioch, the city of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, is modeled carefully after how Stephen presented the very same story in Acts chapter 7, which got him put to death with the nod of approval of a rabbi named Saul Tarsus, now the Apostle Paul. This is transformational grace. And what people need in our culture today is transformational grace. And we become the messengers in both the gathered and in the scattered states of life. The death leads to the resurrection. Love St. Paul's Cathedral. Walk the street, the uh, aisles up and down, thinking about the time in which Winston Churchill had planned his funeral there. At his funeral, he had included many of the great songs of the church used in the typical eloquent Anglican liturgy. Some family members were there to take it in, in the liturgy itself. Well, at Churchill's direction, a bugler positioned high in the dome of St. Paul's, at the time of the benediction, played taps. Of course, that's the universal signal that says the day is over. A hush came over the crowd. But typical Churchillian manner, dramatic turn. As soon as Taps was finished, another bugler placed on the other side of the great dome played Reveille. means it's time to get up. It's morning. People, if you love Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are a child of the morning. It's time to get up. Jesus rose. Notice the message that God has sent. You see it in 26, 27. See the work God has accomplished? You see it in verse 28 through 31. Thirdly, now notice the promise God's fulfilled. Pick it up in verse 32. He says, I'm not going to leave that there. 
I got my sleeves rolled up. It's time to work. And we bring you. Now, he's talking to religious people at this point. He's not even gotten to the secular assault there. That's still to come. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. Now, take that word promise from verse 32. Draw a line back to verse 23. He is connecting the dots for people. Well, I did my bachelor's degree. I lived in a dormitory very near train tracks. Train would go rolling down the tracks towards Chicago. I went to see how, where the, the cars of the trains all were joined together. It's fascinating here. The way in which, in essence, what Paul is saying at this point is that each and every generation, each and every promise of the Old Testament leading to Christ, it's as if another car is being joined to the prior car. And there's a connection. And you've got to create this linear forward movement towards Jesus Christ. This is a train coming down the tracks. You see, the cars are not disconnected from one another. So he's making the connections back to the illustration of last week. Director of Christian Education, standing with me and D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson had been a professor of mine. And she, right before Don was to be introduced, that was my responsibility. How do I minister to those who know the stories but don't know the Savior? They know all about Samson. They know all about Saul. They know all about David. It's informational, but it has been made personal. Like the cars of a train now, you've got to connect them together and allow one story to lead to the next, which leads to the next, until you finally get to the one, the engines driving the story of life. Pause there. You. And so there you have it in Psalm 2, verse 7. It's being quoted here in verse 33. It's as if Paul, now he knows his audience. You can see this brilliant rabbi leaning forward and saying, you are my son. Quoting from Psalm 2, verse 7. Today I have begotten you. My son. When God referred to my son, he was not only talking about the immediacy of David, but the ultimate David, Jesus Christ, connect the cars. This is the one who is the ultimate heir, the ultimate sovereign, the one not standing but seated at the right hand of the Father. See the word today? That refers to First Resurrection Sunday, Easter. You see the word begotten? Carries with the idea of the new official position of authority given to Jesus Christ through resurrection, ascension, and seating. But now he's going to connect his cars still, you see. It's up to verse 34. Pauses to apply. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, and here's what he does. He finds another train car. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3. And now he's going to extract a portion of it for people to connect together to Jesus Christ, the ultimate David. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. And in the Hebrew, it carries with the idea of the unfailing graces that are found here. In other words, there is certainty. Now, you and I are living in uncertain times. The immediacy is somewhat obscure, but the ultimate is secure. In Jesus, you're connecting the cause of the promise. The Psalm 2, verse 7, to the Isaiah 55, verse 3. Isaiah, eight centuries prior to Messiah hitting the turf in Palestine. But you see, God is superintending this master plan of redemption. There's a rescue story. 
It's unfolding. I love it. Zach Williams. There I was, empty-handed, crying out from the pit of my despair. There you were in the shadows, holding out your hand. You met me there. And now, where would I be without you? Where would I be, Jesus? You were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story. You lifted me up from the ashes, carried my soul from the death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. And then later on, he would have us sing together, He never gave up on me. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you've gone through. But in turbulent times, you need timeless truths. In the midst of your crisis, you need Christ. He's your rescue story. He is the sheer blessings that are yours if you put your faith and trust in him. Well, in verse 35, he's got still another car to connect. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, uh, he's up to psalm, he, he's at Psalm 16, the great resurrection psalm. Psalm 16, great promise. You will not let your holy ones see corruption. And now they're leaning forward saying, but wait a second, as it was written to David via David, David saw corruption, and you're saying, but this Messiah sees no corruption. Connect your cars, Paul. He does it for us. 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, not for all generations, in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Speaking of the ultimate David, Jesus. How do you explain this? 2018, I'm in standing at the tomb that's assumed to be the tomb of David in Jerusalem. The very next day, doing the Via Dolorosa, the path that leads to the death of Jesus Christ. The tomb of David, the remains of David. That's the meaning of corruption. The body decays because the body remains there. But what God is saying here is the body didn't remain there because three days later God raised him from the dead. Therefore, though David experienced corruption, Jesus Christ is the incorruptible one. This is how he's connecting the dots. And with these various promises, he's showing it how the promise that God has fulfilled needs to be applied. And now you're up to it because you bring it home in verse 38 through 41. Because fourthly, I want you to see with me here the freedom that God has provided. And now in verse 38, these people now, and you and I likewise, have got to be able to get our arms around this. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers. Notice how he began. Notice how he ends. He's going to stay connected with the people that he is sharing this timeless truth with. Stay connected as you communicate relationally. Maintain true matters doctrinally. Do it practically. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers. He began, brothers. He's back to brothers. That through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. They're religionists. But whether secularists nor religious, you need to hear this. You need to put faith and trust exclusively in Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. And then good news. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Man. Hey, you know, having lived in New England for many years, the license plates of New Hampshire or the slogan made famous by the Revolutionary War, General John Stark, quote, live free or die, unquote. 
Jesus died, we're free. Jesus then rose. We therefore are free. In verse 40, he lays down the option. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets. He's back to connecting all those cars of promise from the Old Testament to the present. Should come about. So now he looks and he's pondering all those that were around the cross and the concentric circles outward pertaining to those who have looked down upon the idea that the cross has something to do with the crises of the times. Look, you scoffers. Be astounded and perish. And then drawing from Habakkuk chapter 1 of verse 5, he says, I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe. Even now, he is doing a work in these days which nobody would believe, even if one tells it to you. There's freedom in Jesus, you see. And this is a generational story. This is a family story. This is a rescue story. Firestone. The purpose of the number on the belt. Mom replies that the company insisted on personal responsibility for the war effort. Number was unique, assigned to only one inspector. And Staples remembered everything about the life belt, and he quoted to her the number. And there was a moment of stunned silence in the room. Mom speaks. That was my personal code. I fixed every item. I was responsible for approving. And he realizes it was out of that sense of personal responsibility. This generational story unfolded in his ears. He was rescued. And what the Apostle Paul has done is connected all the generational stories from Older Testament up to that very moment of the cross brought in a but God and says, no, here's your rescue story. Do you know, Miss Lord and Savior? Let's stand together. And if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior and you're watching a live stream or in this particular service, physically. Simply pray this prayer. God, I realize now that I am a sinner. I am part of the collective guilt when it comes to the relationship to the Holy God of the universe. I repent of my sin. I put my faith exclusively, not now in myself any longer, but in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. Speak to that heart now, Father, of anybody that has just at this moment made this there today for eternity. Stir their hearts, Father, so that they will tell others about the one who died for their sins. Thanking you now, Father, you are the God who brings Christ to the crisis. And so, Father, in the coming days, we've got a story to tell because there's a Savior whose story is worth telling. And for this, we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.